should any clinician inject their personal religious beliefs or values into the care of their patients. There are areas sometimes of conflict which could arise for someone who has certain religious beliefs. My name is Eddie Reichman. I practice emergency medicine in Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, professor of emergency medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and my interest is the relationship of Judaism and medicine. My name is Rachel Nymphs. I'm originally from Sacramento, California, but I go to school at Purdue University. I am going into my fourth year of nursing school at Purdue, hoping to graduate and work in the emergency department. I'm Noah Bukres. I just graduated from California State University, Northridge, and I'm starting my master's in nursing at the John Johns Hopkins School of Nursing in like two-ish weeks. I aspire to maybe working in the ICU or even kind of further to nurse practitioner or something along those lines. In June 2022, the Supreme Court made the decision to overturn the ruling of Roe versus Wade, which was a big issue and a big uprising in this country. So specifically, what does the Torah say about abortions in Judaism? So abortion is one of the more complex areas of, of contemporary Judaism and, uh, and medicine and Jewish medical ethics. The Torah does not uh, approve abortions wholesale for all types of circumstance, uh, and generally it, it prohibits abortion, although the, the exact nature of that prohibition has been a matter of debate. Uh, for centuries. There's no question that abortion is 100% permitted if the, if the mother's life is at risk. Uh, but as far as abortion across the spectrum, uh, for other reasons and other causes, it's, uh, it's really a matter of debate uh, amongst rabbinic authorities. Mm -hmm. The Talmud does discuss cases of abortion going back many thousands of years. The rabbis discussed abortion over the past many thousands of years uh, in different case law, but, but there is not an absolute consensus uh, in terms of the exact nature of that prohibition. And the spectrum of that prohibition includes uh, the more extreme position, which is that uh, abortion is considered similar to or akin to homicide, uh, but not absolute homicide. So in Jewish tradition, a baby in utero, uh, while it has a valued status, is not considered a full human life. So if someone does perform an abortion, for example, in Jewish tradition, they wouldn't be guilty of homicide. So that's one the more extreme kind of position to, uh, to a little less severe uh, positions that maintain that the prohibition of abortion is more akin to, to causing bodily harm or bodily wounding and things like that. Uh, and based on the approach to abortion, uh, different rabbis will adjudicate different cases differently. Uh, so, for example, if abortion is akin to homicide, uh, uh, even though I said it's not exactly equivalent to homicide, then, then the bar is pretty high in terms of prohibition. So to, for sure to save the life of a mother, it's 100 percent permitted. But in a circumstance, for example, where the mother's life is not at risk at all, uh, but the baby might have some, uh, some congenital abnormality or some genetic defect, uh, something like Tay-Sachs disease or something like that, uh, according to that position, probably would not be permitted to perform an abortion. But if, if uh, the rabbi holds that uh, abortion is, uh, is more similar to, to bodily wounding or tort law or causing, causing harm, physical harm to somebody, uh, then the threshold is a little lower. And if there are other mitigating circumstances, including the mental health of the mother or the potential suffering of the fetus, of the child, then it would be permitted to perform uh, perform abortion. As I said, there is no absolute consensus, but the, but the general default position is that abortion is generally prohibited unless there's some right. mitigating circumstance or some compelling reason to perform the right. abortion. If the woman is, her life is in danger, would you recommend like her speaking to the, her rabbi first before making a decision, either continuing the pregnancy or aborting it, or like just trusting the doctor and going with. So you really allude to a very important aspect of, of our conversation. Uh, so um, medicine has advanced tremendously in the 21st century. So many amazing areas of development from beginning of life and genetics, reproductive technology, to transplants, respirators, sustaining people at the, at the end of life, artificial intelligence now being injected into the, into the conversation. If my doctor tells me I need to, to have my appendix taken out, do I have to call my rabbi? 
you know, to say, uh, you know, doctor, is it, rabbi, is it okay if I get an appendectomy? I say, yeah, the answer to that is no, you don't have to call your rabbi. Uh, but there are realms of the practice of medicine where, where dialogue with, with your rabbi would be important. Uh, abortion is one of those areas. Uh, so if you were considering an abortion for whatever reasons, you know, psychological reasons, medical reasons, health of the mother, like, like you mentioned, or, or unfortunately, debility uh, of the child, uh, some genetic defect of the child, uh, those things are more, more complicated in terms of their interrelationship with, uh, with the Judaism. So those are the kinds of cases that you would consult a rabbi for, uh, just like you would, by the way, at the other spectrum of life. So uh, end of life discussions, issues you're interested in intensive care unit uh, you know, nursing, which is a, a, a very- I was about uh, to ask you that yeah, too. <laughs> which, is a, which is a very important field and a very, a very needed field. Uh, and, and there are a lot of questions that come up at the end of life that you would need to discuss with, uh, with a rabbi in, in the context of, of the Jewish tradition. Uh, when do you need to provide care? Uh, under all circumstances, you know, to preserve life, even if a person is suffering immensely, do you still have to put them on a respirator? Do you still have to give them blood transfusions? Do you still have to give them antibiotics? Uh, or do we say that that a person has a right to say, you know, enough, I don't, I don't want to suffer anymore? Uh, and uh, and even though these things could technically prolong uh, my life for minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, I don't want my life prolonged in this kind of agony. So so here also, there's not an absolute consensus in the rabbinic tr tradition about when when you can and when you cannot. Uh, and there there are a number of, of rabbinic uh, positions, but there there clearly are positions that would not require. Uh, someone to undergo therapies that would only preserve a life of, uh, of suffering. So those are the kinds of areas also that you wouldn't want to only discuss with your doctor. Uh, you'd want to discuss with your, uh, with your rabbi as well. Have you ever faced any anti-Semitism as a doctor? Um, and what sort of advice would you give you know, healthcare providers, like Jewish healthcare providers, who are dealing with anti-Semitism from either colleagues or patients? You know, sort of an interesting ethical question is: is let's say I'm the only doctor on call in this uh, in this di in this patient, set and he needs emergent care, uh, and he says, you know, I, I uh, refuse to be treated by you, and I don't have any alternative. And if I don't intervene, he's not going to survive. What would you, you know, do? so what is my what is my role in that kind of uh, situation? So 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 ethically and and halakhically, from a Jewish legal perspective, I am absolutely obligated to treat this person to the best of my ability, which is expressed, by the way, in the state of Israel in in some remarkable fashions when, when you'll find both victim and terrorist side by side in the hospital being treated essentially the same. So it's, it's a complicated kind of landscape, but the, the not only the ethics of medicine in general, but the ethics of our tradition in particular uh, do not uh, differentiate, uh, and we would be, you know, required to uh, to provide the best of medical care that we can provide to these patients. So a big part of working in the medical profession is dealing with grief, loss, and death. How have your personal Jewish values and your Jewish upbringing helped you to cope with those feelings and be able to deal with it in a way that is healthy and also allows you to continue to care for patients? So our, our, our tradition has a lot to say about end-of-life care, about uh, compassion at the end of life, prayer at the end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that really sort of segues into another uh, similar kind of, of question about how much should any clinician inject their personal religious beliefs or values into the care of their patients? There are areas sometimes of conflict where, which which could arise for someone who has certain religious beliefs, in particular uh, in Judaism. So in the society that we live in, withholding or even ending a patient's life uh, is, is, sec is ethically permissible. So if a person's hooked up to a respirator and the family says, I want you to disconnect the respirator, uh, it's not illegal to do that, and it's not considered unethical to do that. And a number of my colleagues would be comfortable in the society that we live in doing that. Uh, in in the Jewish tradition, every case has to be analyzed and understood, uh, and its uh, the nuances of the case have to be understood. But uh, but you know, to disconnect a respirator from someone that will that will most certainly die within a few moments after the disconnection is generally prohibited in, in Jewish tradition. And that's in the scope of my practice in emergency medicine. You would be called upon to do that, and not, you know, not on a daily basis, but it's not uncommon for someone to be called upon to do that. So, so in cases that I'm involved in in those scenarios, I, I would not be comfortable doing that. 
I would refuse to do that. Um, and uh, and the, again, the beauty of living in a country like the United States that is accepting of different types of traditions and different, different types of values, uh, my hospital would support me in that refusal, and I would you know, transfer to the the care to someone who would provide the services that the patient needs uh, that would that would not be in conflict with their particular ethical or uh, or religious beliefs. I'm just wondering, do you know what the Torah's views are about like physician assisted suicide or euthanasia or like for otherwise healthy individuals who just don't want to live anymore? Right, right, right sure, sure. So, so uh, w while we had mentioned there, there's some areas where, where there is debate and there's not consensus, like abortion, there's not an absolute consensus. When to prolong therapy, there's no absolute consensus. But in terms of physician-assisted suicide, there is absolute consensus. In terms of active euthanasia, meaning injecting medication to end the life of the patient, there is absolute uniform consensus uh, of its prohibition of, uh, of tantamount to, uh, to homicide. This is one of those areas that the Jewish tradition is in consonance with other traditions as well, with the Islamic tradition, with the Catholic tradition. But what if someone is, you know, they've gone through a million rounds of chemotherapy and they are exhausted and tired of fighting? Does that change at all depending on the state of the patient or is it still um, a no? To actively end that person's life is still a no. Uh, where that may change is in terms of your obligation to prolong life in that scenario. Uh, so prolonging life of an otherwise healthy person who doesn't want to live, that would be an absolute requirement to do. But if someone who's been through multiple rounds of chemotherapy, no chance for, uh, for uh, recovery, for cure, uh, those are the kinds of scenarios where it may be perfectly appropriate not to do any more uh, therapies, not to intervene yeah. at DNR. If a person has heart stops naturally, not to intervene and resuscitate. Mm -hmm. If a person stops breathing, not to not to intubate. You know, those are the kinds of scenarios. But to such an extent, this goes back to over a thousand years or close to a thousand years with Maimonides, who perpetuates the teachings of the mission of a thousand years earlier, that that even closing the eyes of someone who is in the stages of death mm -hmm. is prohibited because it might cause him to die sooner than he otherwise would have died. Even something as, as minor as just, yeah. you know, just, just closing the eyes. So, so for us as human beings, our role is to cure. The Torah says, it's a, it's, it it's uses the word to heal in a, in a repetitive fashion. And, and you should, and heal, you shall heal, or it's translated, you shall surely heal. Uh, and from there, we learn that, that, that uh, we as human beings have a license to be able to, to treat patients. Mm -hmm. And that it's not only God's domain, we are, we are, we are messengers in, in this world to help God uh, accomplish that role of healing. Um, but we are not messengers of God to, to end people's lives. That's not our role, that's not our domain, and, and that is a, an absolute prohibition of, uh, of thou shalt not murder, it's mm -hmm. homicide. Kind of going a little bit off topic, but how do the kind of rules and principles of Shomer Nagia change when, you know, you're providing care? If someone, you know, an Orthodox woman comes in and, you know, you find out that she's Shomer Nagia, how do you navigate that? Do you treat her? Do you attempt to find a woman physician? This is a very important part of the practice of medicine, not only in the Jewish tradition. Uh, the, the, the concern about uh, intergender uh, medical care uh, and the possibility of abuse of those kinds of uh, relationships is, is extremely important in the society that we live in. We as Jews are very particular about that. Uh, there are extensive discussions in Jewish law about the propriety of, uh, of a male physician treating a female pe uh, patient. Uh, indeed, going back thousands of years, the, the prayers it, it kind of got lost throughout history. But, but there was a tradition for many centuries for Jewish physicians to say a prayer in the morning uh, before they begin their day at the clinic, you know, or their day at the hospital. And there are a number of components of that prayer. Uh, the prayer included, of course, that everything I do should be with God's, uh, uh, under God's auspices, and I'm a messenger, and uh, I should be a good messenger, and I should be, a, you know, a physician who helps cure patients, not helps uh, to cause harm for patients. And uh, and one of the aspects of that is I shouldn't violate any concerns or prohibitions if, uh, as a male physician treating a female patient. Uh, today, that's manifest 
Uh, so obviously, if I need to do a physical exam on a, on a female patient, it's, it's completely halachically appropriate to do. If you need to do an intimate form of exam, you know, I'm an ER physician, I have to do gynecological exams as part of my normal practice. I need to have a chaperone in the room, but a chaperone in the room isn't only for the Jewish doctors. Every single doctor, because of concerns of, of possible uh, issues between a male patient and a female patient in such an intimate exam, they, uh, it's every single male doctor who, who does a gynecological exam on a female patient needs to have a chaperone in the room. So it's, that's actually, it's beneficial for me that that's yeah. the circumstance because I would require that even if, if the hospital didn't require it. Um, but, but as you can imagine, uh, you know, the hospital does get sued from time to time and there are these egregious, terrible circumstances where abuse takes place in these kinds of uh, relationships. So, so as an Orthodox Jewish physician, that's, that's a very important uh, part of my practice. Rabbi Dr. Rechman, thank you so, so much for, you know, meeting with us and answering these questions as, as two people who are super excited to enter into the medical profession and two young Jewish women. You're an inspiration to us that we can stand strong in our faith and still provide high quality care. And we really thank you for your time today. Thank you. It's my absolute pleasure. I look forward, I look forward to seeing you in the uh, clinical environment one day. Awesome. <laughs>